5.15 is the time of the Prince Orthopedic Associate Studios. A lot of playoff football this weekend, wild card weekend, as it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's a good time to be Tony Baselli, calling the games for Westwood One this weekend. And also, the Pro Football Hall of Fame finalist list came out, and he's on that list of 15 names for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And Tony Baselli's kind enough to give us a few minutes right now. Tony, first off, congratulations. Thanks for a few minutes, and how are you? Oh, thank you very much. My pleasure to come on with you. Well, before we talk about the big announcement that was made a few days ago, I do have to bring up your college football team, and that's USC. I'm still recovering from that Rose Bowl. What a game, Tony. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. It was a game of many emotions. At the beginning, I'm like, all right, this will be a nice, easy one. We're going to blow them out. Then I look, and I'm like, golly, we're going to get blown out in the second half. And then somehow uh, down 14 late, we came back. And Sam Darnold, what a player. I mean, what a player. And uh, so happy for those guys. I, I think Clay Helton is a heck of a coach. He's doing a great job and uh, turned that thing around and uh, really had a great season after a tough start. And he, uh, he is to be commended with the entire staff and all those players. And the crazy part is you haven't even seen a full season of Sam Darnold just getting put in that situation, not being the start in the beginning of the year. This kid's going to be the number one pick in the draft one day as long as he stays healthy, right, Tony? I believe that. I think he is a fabulous quarterback. Uh, he has all the intangibles. He's a leader. He's great in the pocket. And then you look at the measurables. He's athletic, big, strong kid, got a great arm. Uh, I mean, he – I mean – He's what you want in a quarterback, and the poise he shows is tremendous. So I, yeah, I, I agree with you. If he can stay healthy, keep on playing good football, and, uh, you know, the other thing you worry about with young guys, you know, and I think Sam's the type of guy who's a grinder, but you don't want you don't, you don't want to get comfortable. You never get comfortable as a player thinking you've got it figured out. You, you, the great ones are guys who are always hungry and are always trying to get better themselves, not worried about what everyone else is saying, not worried about what other people are doing, but them, they are trying to improve themselves. Was there ever a time in your career where you got complacent and maybe took some things for granted? You know, I think it's always a struggle, especially when you're young. You know, at USC, I had early success and, you know, made preseason All-American after my redshirt freshman year and, you know, had some success and, I worked hard, but I don't think I really learned how hard I needed to work until I got, you know, you know, end of junior year, going into my senior year, and was really challenged by John Robinson, my coach, and Mike Berry, my offensive line coach. And I think every young player, it's a maturation process. You learn what hard work really is and what it takes to be great. And uh, and so uh, it was Clay Helton. He's a great coach. He, so Sam Donald's fortunate to have good people around him. And I, I trust that the process will be good and he'll uh, continue to improve and be a, uh, you know, fulfill the potential that he has. The Hall of Fame is the highest individual honor in the sport. You're a finalist. I know you know that you got one more step to go before you could call yourself a member of Canton, but still a, an elite list and a very special one. When you found the news, uh, what was your first reaction about being a finalist for the Hall of Fame? Well, it's, uh, you, you almost don't know what to think. It's such an honor. And then you start thinking about the other guys on the list with you, the other 14 guys, just great players. And you think about the guys who are in the Hall of Fame and the players that you grew up watching and following and some of the just the, the history of the NFL and professional football. Um, and to think that you can maybe possibly be included in that group one day is so humbling. And uh, I don't really know how to think half the time. But I know it's a huge <laughs> honor. I know it's exciting. And uh, my family and is real excited. And the cool thing for me, I have five kids. And, and because my, you know, I got hurt and career was cut a little bit short, uh, my kids are so little, they don't remember watching Dad play. So it's fun seeing my boys who both play college, uh, one plays college football, one's getting ready to go play college football, kind of look at the TV and say, heck, Dad, you were pretty good. So uh, it, it was, it's a fun time for our whole family. You're the cool dad now with this announcement. Uh, let me ask you, though, when you were growing up, who were some of those players that you looked up to and said, hey, I would love to be that type of offensive lineman one day? Well, I was like most kids. You know, I, did, I mean, I, I don't think I dreamed of being an offensive lineman when I was little. I mean, I was in the backyard. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, so I was a huge Bronco fan. And uh, going to Mile High Stadium, and I, every once in a while, my dad would take me down to the – I mean, we'd be in the top, you know, deck and – watching the Broncos play, and I was a huge John Elway fan. And, uh, you know, growing up, and, you know, I wanted to, you know, score touchdowns or sack the quarterback and, you know, be that guy. And it wasn't until I got in high school and got – I didn't play offensive line until my junior year in high school. 
And then when I went to USC, it's obvious, you know, you look up at the great players who played there, and Anthony Munoz is a guy that, uh, you know, I've always, you know, watched film of him when I was at USC. When I got in the NFL, he was retired, but he was doing games, and he he, he came and talked to me and was such a, uh, a good friend and uh, someone, you know, he, you know, if he can live up to his standard, I mean, boy, I think he's the best ever, so... Uh, he would be definitely a guy that, you know, from SC that you want to play like and uh, and be like. So, but growing up, uh, heck, I want to be like, I wanted to score touchdowns. I didn't want to be the offensive lineman. Yeah, no, I exactly hear you. I'm a big guy myself. And when I played football, you never envisioned, I always thought of myself as the quarterback when you were in your basement, maybe a seven, eight years old and envisioning winning a Super Bowl. Who was the toughest defender you ever had to block, though, in the NFL, Tony? Well, before I tell you that, you you won't believe it. I went, my sophomore year in high school, I went out for quarterback. I played as a freshman. I played quarterback, and as a sophomore, I went out for quarterback. And uh, Sam Pagano was my uh, high school coach, Chuck Pagano's uh, dad. Oh wow! Head coach, head coach at the Colts. And uh, about five minutes into the first practice, I'm talking the first two a day, he walks up to me. He says, "Tell him." We're going to move you to tight end. And uh, he, he told me later he didn't have the heart to move me all the way to the offensive line right away. He thought it would just crush me. And so I was a quarterback for five minutes my sophomore year. And after that, I had my hand in the dirt, and the rest is history. Now, hold and on. Then as, far, as far as the you know toughest guys, I played against some great players. I mean, sure. Bruce Smith, Hall of Famer. Uh, played against John Randall. Boy, he, he what a tough night. I, it was playing him in Minnesota. He kicked out the defensive end, just a fabulous player. Uh, the late Derek Thomas, uh, all great players. And then a guy that, you know, most people don't probably don't know, he's not a household name, but played for the Baltimore Ravens for a lot of years, was a double-digit sack guy for five or six years, and Michael McCrary played him twice a year, and he was just a – he was a, one of the toughest players I ever played. He, he, he you know, was just a, just played the game the right way. So I, I played against a lot of great players, and uh, they were all a challenge, all brought out the best of me, and uh, all made me work really hard. Now, hold on. i got to get back to the quarterback thing. you got to give me an honest scouting report of Tony Baselli, the quarterback. Yeah. I had a good arm. I could spin it. Um, it wasn't real mobile. I was uh, dry. I had to sit in that pocket. And uh, you can imagine when I, you know, I didn't grow to my body. And you, when you're big and tall, you kind of get, you know, a little bit awkward. And uh, I think as a sophomore, I was very awkward. So the chance of me running away from anybody, not good. Uh, not good. <laughs> I would not have been a read option quarterback. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Tony Baselli with us right now on the Zach Gelb Show. All right, I got to get to this Giants-Packers game coming up this weekend. A lot of people are making a whole lot of fuss about the Giants wide receivers after the game going to Miami and partying it on their off day. Uh, you've had a, played in a lot of uh, playoff games. Just what were your off days like in preparation for a playoff game? Well, I promise you I wasn't going to South Beach chaining on a boat because my wife would have had my head. <laughs> so that was not going to happen. Um, I, here's my theory on it. You know, as long as you're ready to play, I'm fine with it. Because I have a lot of I agree. That did a lot of things that, you know, I wouldn't do. And, heck, I did things in college I didn't think was smart, you know, as far as getting ready for a football game. Um, and so as long as you're ready to play, you know, do I think it's the smartest thing to do? Is it, is it what I'm going to do? No. Uh, but with the ability to fly in a private jet, go down there for a day and come back, you know, so be it. I mean, I'm not worried about it. Those are great players. My question is why are they sitting on a boat with boots and jeans and taking pictures like they're posing for a GQ magazine? I'm not sure about that the whole deal. But as far as them spending their off day like that, it's an off day. Just be smart and be ready to come back to work when uh, we when when you're at practice. What do you think your former coach Tom Coughlin would say about that? Because he was a no nonsense type of guy. He'd have lost his mind. <laughs> and I promise you, Wednesday morning when they showed back up to work, each one of them would have been in his office. And uh, he, whether it would have done anything or not, he would have shared his opinion <laughs> with them of them going down there. But he would have it would have drove him crazy. What was it like to play for Coach Coughlin? It was tough. I mean, it was really tough early um, because everyone talked, you know, he's such a tough guy, disciplinarian, but heck, yeah, those are nice words uh, as far as how he was those first couple years. I mean, he was a nightmare. I mean, he would grind you to death, and it was never good enough, and you practice hard, and he was on you, and he was a micromanager of every aspect of everything happened in that building. 
and he could wear on you, but he was a great coach. And uh, he did a great job of bringing us together and getting us going. Uh, but it was, it was tough at times. It was really tough, but he made you a better player. And you can argue with the, some of the ways he did it, but the results speak for themselves. And he's got guys to play hard and play, to play as a team. Would you take him back as the head coach of the Jaguars? Absolutely. Absolutely, I would. Uh, I don't know if he wants to coach anymore. He's going to be 71 years old to start the season. Uh, his legacy speaks for itself. But uh, knowing Coach Coughlin, he still has, if he wants to do it, I'm sure he could do it for a few more years. And I think he'd be a great uh, asset to any organization. And uh, he's a heck of a football coach. Getting back to this Packers and Giant game coming up this weekend, having your inside opinion, being a great broadcaster for Westwood One right now, what do you think that game ultimately comes down to? Well, I think it's the Giants' defense. You know, they're they're the second uh, scoring defense in the NFL. They are played great. They spent all that money, and that doesn't always work in the NFL. You spend a bunch of money in free agency, you don't get the results right away, and they did. And uh, they're going to have to carry the load because that, the Giants' offense. You know, they got all the weapons: Odell Beckham and Eli Manning. But they don't run the ball very well, which I think is a tough thing, especially in the playoffs. Don't score a lot of points. Um, so the defense is going to have to really shut down Aaron Rodgers and that Packers offense, who've gotten it rolling in the back half of the season. So if they can't do that, I think it's going to be a tough day. If the, if the Giants' defense doesn't have a great effort, uh, I think it's going to be a tough day. Uh, for the Giants team. Tony Baselli with us right now. Get into the game that you'll be broadcasting, Steelers and Dolphins. Give me your thoughts on this matchup because a lot of people think the Steelers are going to win this game at ease. Well, I, I, I'm always care. I'm always, it's always dangerous, I think, to say at ease. I mean, I, I played in games where we're, with the Jaguars earlier where we were huge yeah. underdogs. I mean, 15 point, half, 15 half point underdogs to the Broncos. We went up there and beat them. Did it in Buffalo when we were big underdogs. And games get tight, come down to turnovers. Uh, if a team can run the ball, and the Dolphins with Jay Ajaya can run the ball, if they can get that ground game going and, and, try, and control the clock and keep Ben and uh, Le'Veon Bell and, and Antonio Brown on the sidelines, they got a chance. Now, the Steelers are the better team, and they're playing great football. And those three guys I just mentioned are dynamic and in the addition, the way that they're running the ball with Le'Veon Bell right now makes them really tough because they're so hard to defend. If you put that extra guy in the box, now all of a sudden you got Antonio Brown one on one outside, and that's a nightmare. So uh, it's going to come down to that offensive line for the for the Dolphins get J.J. going, and uh, if they can do that, they got a they got a they got a chance. I think the Steelers, you know, they're the favorite. Uh, that's who I'd pick if I was picking games. Uh, but it, I don't think it's going to be at ease, especially if the running game of the Dolphins gets going. You know, Tony, it's actually so crazy this year, and we've seen backup quarterbacks obviously play in the postseason before, but you got three of them playing in the AFC. It's wild how many injuries have occurred at the quarterback position, especially late in the season. Heck, half the time, get, just getting to the playoffs isn't enough. It's getting to the playoffs and having your top-line guys there. And the one thing, though, with the Dolphins, Matt Moore is a backup. But he he's done a nice job. You go look at his games he's played. He's two and one in three starts. His quarterback rating is ninety three point four. Tannehill is only ninety three point five. So it's not like it's a huge drop off to Matt Moore. He he loses a little bit of the athletic ability and the mobility that Tannehill can give you with all the zone read stuff he can do. But I don't think this is going to be a scenario where you go, oh my gosh, you got the back with quarterback, you know, and you can tell right away that it's too much for him. Matt Moore is a guy with a lot of poise, and I think I don't think the situation will be too big for him. I think he'll come out. I think he'll play fine. Tony, if you had to make the case for a team in the AFC and the team in the NFC, who's your Super Bowl pick right now? Well, in AFC, it's easy. I mean, it's Patriots. Really the Patriots. I mean, they got home field advantage. They play great up in Gillette. Tom Brady is. I think he's just looking forward to the chance to be on the podium with Roger Goodell and tell him what he thinks about <laughs> yeah. the play game. And, uh, and you know, they're they're so tough and. With all the injuries in the AFC, you know, no Derek Carr. You really like the Raiders if they had him. Uh, so that's tough. The Texans, they don't have a quarterback. Um, you know, I, I give the Chiefs or the uh, Steelers a fighting chance up in Gillette, but I really like the, the Patriots. And then the NFC, I think it's going to be great. You got the Cowboys, we got a bunch of rookies. How's Dak Prescott going to react to that situation? Uh, obviously, you got that great offensive line. And I really like the Atlanta Falcons right now. 
you know, as dynamic as they are, as they are on offense, and as well as they're playing right now, I think they're going to be a huge challenge for that Cowboy team. And then, and then you look at the Packers and the Seahawks. Both of them have playoff experience, guys who played in big games. So I think it's one of those four teams. I probably lean towards that Dallas because of their ability to run the ball and control the, the line of scrimmage, and I think that's so important in the playoffs. It's just unbelievable what Brady's doing at 39, missing the first four games of the season, 28 touchdowns, two interceptions, already has four Super Bowl rings on his resume. It's starting to get hard to, if you're one of those people that say he's not the best ever, uh, it's not to start saying he is the best ever because what he's doing right now at 39 two. Uh, you don't see too many players get better with age, and he's been one of those players, Tony. Well, maybe the, missing the first four games was the best thing ever. Yeah, he's fresh. Right. He's, you know, he feels great and uh, playing great football. And his spot in history is cemented. And I, I think it's hard to say he's the greatest quarterback ever is because there's so. I mean, there's a handful that. How do you separate? I mean, how do you? I mean, how do you choose between John Elway or Joe Montana? You know, you, 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 Tom Brady, I mean, Peyton Manning, what he's been able to do. You look at the Brett Bars of the world, Dan Marie. I mean, they, they, you start trying to figure out which one's the greatest. I think just being mentioned with that group uh, is a, you're elite. And Tom Brady is right there, and you can easily argue that he's the greatest of all time just with what he does. I know this. If I was, everyone says, you know, talks about Aaron Rodgers, who's a fabulous quarterback, absolutely fabulous. But for my money, if I had to pick a guy right now to go win me, you know, to lead me for one season, even at 39, I'm taking Tom Brady. What he's able to do uh, mentally, uh, his accuracy, his leadership ability uh, is remarkable to me. And uh, he is just so fun to watch, and I got the utmost respect for him. How many more years do you think he's going to be playing for, Tony? I mean, at this rate, 50, 11, he probably plays till he's 50. I mean, my goodness. I mean, the guy is remarkable. And he looks more athletic now than, you know, he did a few years ago. He looks in great shape. I don't know what he's doing, but uh, he takes great care of himself. And, and what he's able to do in the pocket, because he's so smart, he doesn't take a lot of huge hits. Gets rid of the ball. You know, he's, I think the only thing that's going to be is his arm strength. You know, how, how, can he maintain arm strength? Uh, because the rest of his body looks like it's holding up. And, uh, you know, at least I would say three, two or three more years, he's going to be out there playing at a high level. Last one for Tony Baselli. You know that getting into the Hall of Fame now, it's out of your control. You did all you could as a player during your playing days. But let's say if you had to make the case for Tony Baselli to be a Hall of Famer, what would your argument be? I won't give it. I refuse. I've been asked that, and I just won't do it. My case has been made. I played the game. You can watch the film. I played the the guys I played against. Uh, played it the, to the best of my ability, and my case has been made. I did it with, with on the football field, and it's not up for like you said. It's out of my control. It's not up for me anymore. It's, it's up to the the writers who are in that room, and now they got two Hall of Famers and uh, Dan Fouts and John uh, James Lawson will be in there as well. And they'll make they'll make the decision. Um, that right now, where it's at, really, what's important to me, obviously, what those forty eight guys think, because they're going to determine it. But the guys I played against, the people who coached me and watched me, uh, you know, they can make the judgment whether I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame or not. Well, Tony, we wish you the best of luck. We'll see you in Houston. Thanks so much, and congratulations once again. Hey, thanks for having me.